university curricular prototypes that I did personally. And then we broadened that out to working with and collaborating with uh, universities and design schools around the world. Uh, and that led to some perspectives on design that I like to share. And then I want to finish up with a, an overall initiative that we're running now uh, called the Future of Design Education uh, Project. So let me start by telling you a little bit about sort of the transformation the IBM company has gone through. So we usually use the term pivot to refer to a, a, a drastic fo refocusing um, of a startup. Um, but my argument is that uh, even 100 year, year plus uh, old companies like IBM uh, can and should pivot as well. So the IBM company some uh, eight years ago needed to pivot because all of the technologies and all of the markets that the IBM company was in um, were drastically changing. So we needed to pivot the company in almost each of those uh, markets and, and technology areas. And so we also got a new uh, CEO at the time and the person of Ginny Rometty, who was brilliant and who also gave our design organization this objective to create a global sustainable culture of design and design thinking at IBM. Some key words there, sustainable, and actually focusing on the culture of design and design thinking across a massive uh, large company. So what did we do? We basically put together a, an overall transformation plan that was led by somebody that came into the company some three years before that uh, in the name of Phil Gilbert. He had been running a company uh, that IBM acquired called Lombardi Software, uh, which just did an awesome job at design and design thinking, top to bottom of the company, side to side. And so Phil uh, and a few of us um, put together basically this transformation plan for the IBM company. And one of the things that I did was introduce that new model, and I'll tell you more about that model in a minute, uh, to the company. Uh, so I basically in uh, 2013 went around to all IBM uh, product studios or uh, uh, labs around the world where we develop products and we have a lot of those and introduce them through um, town halls and uh, individual uh, meetings and the like. So for all of our product organizations to get with our program. Uh, and then the next year was focusing on our services organization that works directly with clients. Um, and then we have these uh, garages that really work on sort of innovation kickoffs and incubators with companies. Uh, we've also injected uh, our design system into those. Another organization, the technology services organization, even focusing uh, on and working with our sales organization so that they could really adopt design sensibilities with regard to designing what they're doing uh, an engagement with a client to really deeply understand that a client from their point of view, rather than thinking about whatever they had on the truck that they wanted to sell, so to speak. And then since 2019, the beginning of 2019, I've been working with academia. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here is the work we've been, been doing there. So what was really part of our design system? Our design system uh, is what we call enterprise design thinking. It has these core components to it, a set of principles, focusing on user outcomes as the primary uh, focus. Uh, also on the far right, diverse empowered teams. And we take that quite literally in terms of making sure that we have teams that are diverse in all respects. And we have a lot of work to do in that area still, but also very importantly, focusing on empowered people that can actually run with the design work that they're uh, coming up with. Um, and then we have, have a focus on restless reinvention, which is also what's in the center of this chart, our loop observing, reflecting, and making. And I'll go a little bit more into that uh, detail into that in a minute. And then very importantly, we also wrapper all of this with what we call the keys. We have these notion of hills, three basically statements of intent. What would the end result of what it is that we're designing, you know, uh, look, look like and work like for the person that it's intended for? And uh, they're in the form of who is gonna be able to do what with what wow experience. 
And we have this notion of playbacks, which is basically sharing the evolving uh, experience of uh, a user with whatever product or service we're developing and getting input from all the key stakeholders on that on a regular basis. And then last, certainly, but not least, our focus on what we call sponsor users, rather than going to many, 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 many hundreds of users, we really want to find appropriately representative users and a small number, all of like four or five or so that we're going to work a lot with, like several hours, hours a week. So that's our, sir. So that's our overall focus on sort of enterprise design thinking. We also figured that what we needed to have was an environment that would be conducive to design and making sure that we didn't have what is often the case for companies. And that is um, people sitting in cubicles and it's the fastest way to suck creativity uh, and innovation and collaboration uh, out of people. So we wanted to create studios that were collaborative and, 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 and encouraging creativity and innovation. So we now have uh, close to 100 of those uh, studios around the world, uh, but those studios mostly look like this today, um, just like the way we're communicating with one another today as well in this, uh, this conference. Um, but they still are uh, studios that work together and collaborate with, with one another and skill, uh, have skill exchange, exchanges and the like as well. We also went from about 230 designers eight years ago to 2,500 uh, designers uh, formally trained um, now. And we did that with a impressed intentional uh, focus of making sure that we had ratios in our you know, product and services organizations that were appropriate to make sure that we had, for example, uh, at least one designer for uh, for every eight uh, eight to 12 uh, developers, for example, um, making sure that it wasn't the case that as we had years ago, uh, where you know you, you have a question of, do you have a designer? Yes, we have one. Well, no, let's actually plan the number of designers we need and also the particular expertise that we need, visual design, uh, user experience uh, design, user research, content design, et cetera, all um, focused on what skills do we need and how many of those do we need uh, on the team. We also though did an assessment, and this is directly relevant to the conversation that we're gonna have here, on the skills that people came in from the various design schools and what skills were missing. So we actually asked our uh, hires, people that came into the company, you know, that after they'd been in the company for, you know, a year or two or three, uh, ask them this question, please indicate what was missing or insufficient in your formal education as a designer. And what was interesting at the bottom left of this chart is that the primary discipline skills, largely the craft skills, they're fine. I think schools do a great job at, at teaching craft skills, but a lot of the rest of these percentages you see are missing. So the bottom right, a huge focus on multidisciplinary collaboration. I mean, designers come in not knowing the vocabulary or the biases or, or the kinds of things that engineers, um, computer science students, uh, or, or business students, the way that they work. And conversely, each of those disciplines, by the way, has that same problem, right? They all come out of their own discipline silos. And so a huge challenge in coming to work in a place like IBM, and I would submit any organization that has multiple disciplines, was actually learning about and then working with those other disciplines on a team to be able to actually create any outcomes that are effective. Also a real focus on the top left working world knowledge. Uh, a lot of the time, and this is uh, together with complex real world problems, a lot, a lot of the time students will have done one little project that they chose for themselves um, and they hadn't had any experience uh, of what actual um, design work in the working world feels like and looks like uh, and smells like. Uh, so that's another major uh, gap that I think we need to fill while people are uh, in their educational period at uh, university and design schools. And then last but not least, actually focusing on design thinking theory and practice and doing it properly. A, number, a lot of schools uh, don't teach it at all, um, and which I think is a mistake. And then 
lot of the schools also teach it incorrectly. And I'm going to be getting into that as well. And a lot of organizations, uh, I think, do an incredibly b- a bad job of um, using design thinking incorrectly. So what did we do? Uh, so if we had those gaps, we developed a, a three-month boot camp for all new hires. Uh, initially, it was just design. But over time, it was also we realized the same uh, skill gaps existed for business and also front end uh, development engineering. So we basically brought people into Austin, Texas in the U.S. for a three month period to basically close those gaps so that after those three months, they could actually go into the the teams they're going to be working on uh, and actually be successful. We also decided to activate and we use the term activate rather than educate because uh, we use you know experiential learning in all of this a little bit of instruction but a whole lot of just learning while doing with 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 guidance and coaching so we also created a one week activation session for our product teams so the whole uh, like two people from the design team two people from business two people from engineering from a product organization would come uh, essentially for a week and actually work on their products while using and learning uh, actively the design thinking methods that they were learning. Um, And then we did that for a while. And some months down the road, we'd go back to those teams that had gone through that one week activation, for example, and said, how's that going? And they would come back and say, you know what, we love working this way. This is so, so good. I mean, we're doing things with some of the methods we're using now that um, after having worked on a product for like 15 years, a 15 minute exercise using these design thinking methods gives us insight that um, in 15 minutes that we didn't get for 15 years working on this product. Like So super powerful you know, methods, but the feedback was that there was a problem and that is the executives above them were still expecting them to produce a high fidelity prototype after the first week of working on a product, for example, um, when in actual fact, the uh, team now knew how to go and do some user research to really come up with the, uh, the challenges and the like that the users were having that they needed to address with design. So we also figured that we needed to do some activation for executives, which we did, uh, a one-day session um, with everybody from the C-suite, basically right from the top of the company all the way through uh, all the executives in the company as well. So if you want to change the culture of an organization, these are the kind of things you need to do. And then we also created a a governance system, basically uh, reviewing progress and making mid-course corrections and the like, and then applied all these methods to our top product areas and also to our services with clients uh, as well. Now, we did all of that in person uh, in like those, those three month boot camps, the one week uh, uh, um, you know, education sessions and activation sessions with product teams and like, and also the executive ones, they were all in person. And we also decided that if we we're going to really scale this through a massive uh, company, then we needed to put a lot of this online as well, which we did. So we now have uh, online education that you can win badges doing. Uh, and so, and that I say that uh, uh, with some uh, careful choice of those words, uh, people actually really um, value getting these badges after they've attained the the right level of knowledge and mastery. And so it starts off with doing a, a practitioner badge, which is basically a two hour introduction to these methods then a um, a collaborative experience of actually doing work together with others for um, a period of time uh, can lead to the co-creator badge. And then the coach badge is is more difficult to get, uh, but it's one that where somebody can actually lead and and, and coach others uh, doing it as well. And then we have other uh, badges for people that are leading, not doing uh, the work as well, uh, the advocate and leader badge as well. Now I should just mention, So when we think about these design sensibilities and design thinking is a way of uh, uh, putting those together for people that are on a full team. Our view here really for designers and others is this notion of the T-shaped person, this whole notion of saying, you know what, you have your deep skills, your you know, core discipline skills, which is basically the the vertical stroke of the T, if you will. 
and you need to further develop that. And, and there's some uh, encouragement that we provide to make that wider as well, just learn more skills from other disciplines and the like. But I wanted to make the point that the horizontal stroke of the T, and these are the kind of skills that everybody should, should have, um, that's really where we place enterprise design thinking, that we expect everybody in the company to really be using these methods and these design sensibilities in everything that we do. And so, um, and some people say, well, you know, does that take power away from designers? Heck no. Designers can work more effectively when you have the, the whole team using very appropriately uh, educated and then, and then practiced design thinking. But I'd like to also make the point that you have to do design thinking properly and not do what I like to call innovation theater, which I would submit that about, I don't know, 80% of all the organizations uh, that are using design thinking are using innovation theater. They think they're being creative. They've got some post-it notes and Sharpies, and they might even be doing that digitally now. Um, but they're not really doing it properly. And in fact, it's probably giving design thinking a bad name in the way that they actually practice this. So let's think about that loop that I talked about earlier, the notion of, of, of observing, really doing the user research, reflecting, doing the design thinking, uh, sort of workshopping methods, and then also actually making. So what if you only do the observing and reflecting and you don't ever make? Well, that's analysis paralysis. You're never actually going to create anything if you do that. What about if you only do the design thinking methods um, uh, of, of, of ref, uh, ref, what I'm calling reflecting, um, and then you're going directly to making from that and call that flying blind because you don't actually have input with regard to understanding the users appropriately to be able to inform the design. What if you don't even do the design thinking methods itself? Uh, we like to call that sort of taking orders. You're basically just observing and then directly putting that into like a product design. And that is a formula for, I think, building a monster of, of, of products uh, in the sense of you're not carefully prioritizing what needs to go, go in. And so you're going to put way too much into the product and it's going to make, make it way too unusable and too complex. What if you only do the design thinking um, methods of, you know, the workshopping methods? Uh, and you don't do the other uh, that I talked about. That's what I call innovation theater. So you're not doing any user research. You're not actually creating anything after the result of these methods. Um, argue that if that's what you're going to do, don't do it. Uh, don't even use design thinking if that's how you're going to actually uh, practice it. You need to make sure that you're actually doing the work of understanding users appropriately by doing user research, ethnographic observation and interviews and that kind of thing, using the design thinking methods to really reflect on those using empathy mapping, using as a scenario mapping and the like. And then you want to also ideate and then now create prototypes initially in paper and pencil in doing the making of these uh, ideas that you're, you're, you're exploring. And then really importantly, you're going to be going through this loop many, many times. You're going to be iterating. You're going to be learning, you know, as you go. That's truly how I think the design sensibility of design thinking really should be practiced. The other thing that I wanted to share is that we also, uh, in addition to those methods, uh, we also have this notion of a target skill model and that somebody that we hire comes in from, you know, design school or business school or uh, whatever, uh, and has their core discipline, which is great. This is how they sort of come in. They, they only have the stuff on the left side. And then what we need to do as well, in addition to kind of the training that I talked about, was also getting knowledge about the domain that they're going to be working in, you know, both the industry and the technology uh, domain, and also sort of the business strategy. And the way we see this is that once you've actually got that started, um, early on, that's where you get some uh, initial spaces for innovation and excellence, but it really takes knowing your core discipline, knowing all these other, you know, multidisciplinary experiences and all the things that I talked about earlier, together with the domain knowledge of where they're, where they're working, uh, and also the business strategy to truly get innovation and excellence in, you know, product and services uh, design.
So when we've done all of that, and we've done that for a number of years now, um, we also are now delighted that we're now getting, and this is like in one year, uh, last year, we got uh, 40 plus uh, product design awards from the work that we're doing. So we know we're doing something right with regard to that. Well, what about actually the... Um, the total economic impact. And here Forrester uh, did a study uh, also of particularly our, of our clients. And to the surprise of many people who think that doing things this way slows you down and that it's very expensive and that return on investment won't be very high. In actual fact, you can get to market twice as fast if you do this stuff correctly. You're gonna be understanding the market better and users better. So you're going to make uh, fewer mistakes uh, in terms of getting that uh, wrong and then being able to actually uh, very quickly um, build what it is that users want to have. And also they uh, determined there was a 300% return on investment with the investment in design and using design thinking. And they did also did an unaided recall of uh, asking the question, what organization comes to mind when we say design thinking? And some 52% of uh, industry leaders uh, came up with IBM as that um, as that name. So all the work that I was just talking about her, uh, earlier about really changing the culture of IBM and making a sustainable culture of design and design thinking is not only leading to kind of the, the design outcomes that we want in terms of the awards and the like, but also uh, some good uh, uh, metrics outcomes as well as articulated here. So let's, let's think about a little bit about the education uh, itself um, and digging into it some more. So I got involved in this largely because I, in those early days, and this is in 2015, um, I was traveling the world uh, and working with our, our design organizations. And uh, I went to uh, the UK, went to uh, London and had a, a conversation with our teams there. And it was the end of a day that they had done a bunch of interviewing of students uh, in order to determine whether we were going to hire them, hire them. And we have a very rigorous uh, method for doing that. Um, and we also have a, a, a rigorous sort of analysis that uh, whether somebody meets the bar or not. And I think that they had interviewed some eight uh, students during the day. And they said, hey, Carl, you want to talk to you because... It turns out that none of the eight actually met the bar uh, for hiring that we had. What should we do? And I think they had like three headcount um, of, of hiring tickets that they had. And they were worried that this is getting toward the end of the year, that they might, might lose that uh, sort of headcount. Uh, should they you know, choose the best of the ones that they did interview or should they still keep that bar high? Um, and could I help them make sure that they could keep that headcount? And that's essentially what I told them is that, you know, well, I'll do what I can to make sure that you keep the headcount, but let's even keep that uh, bar high. And so that, then we didn't actually hire anybody, uh, anybody out of that day of interviewing. And what was interesting was right after that, I actually had a, a meeting with the uh, the director of the um, uh, design council in the UK, and we started talking about you know design at at at, um, at the various design schools uh, and, and the like about some of the gaps that we we're seeing that I've talked about uh, already, and uh, and also about this notion that we had this three uh, month boot camp. And so we started our conversations there. And then right after that, I ended up having an interview with the press about um, where any questions that they wanted to ask. And it turns out that we also got into this conversation. Now, they ended up making it this headline, the IBM uh, design director, UK universities need to create better designers and more of them, which is really an overstatement of what I was actually saying. Um, but and it wasn't limited to the UK and it wasn't that they were uh, uh, so um, uh, problematic. It's just that there were, there were additional gaps and skills that we talked about here already that we needed to add in uh, as well as in addition to their core sort of uh, craft skills and the like. So what was interesting about this was that this led to a lot of conversations with, uh, with the design schools and universities in general. And that led me to locally, I'm based in Toronto, Canada, uh, to work with some local schools here 
and actually uh, created what I consider to be some curriculum uh, prototypes. So uh, developed a multidisciplinary real world problem focused pan university course for a variety of disciplines so that they could all learn to how to work together and also use these design thinking kind of methods. Uh, also developed programs for emerging health leaders uh, as well as an executive MBA program and even one for board directors that should also be thinking and working in this way as well. And then after having done that, and that yielded really, really positive uh, outcomes, and those uh, programs are really, really popular, usually limited by the whatever room size we uh, could uh, get the students into, um, that we also decided to focus on basically um, opening the aperture of this sort of, uh, I started this just locally here, wanted to start working and collaborating with way more schools also that changed the, the the engagement to be even more broad than that and then also to broaden the scope of uh, not only design but also uh, other uh, disciplines as well so what it did was uh, focused on design schools and uh, identified sort of the top ones uh, based on rankings um, research universities that also had design business and engineering schools and then also in the United States, focused on historically black colleges and universities uh, as well. And the form of that engagement was uh, we used to uh, charge, we don't anymore now, uh, for the um, online education that I talked about earlier that we have. Um, and But we made that uh available for free uh, to the schools that we're working on uh, working with so they could learn the, the practitioner uh, badge and we encourage uh, teams to and this is what I do with my teaching as well uh, that two hour uh, uh, introductory course is one that uh, students need to uh, actually take before they uh, start the, uh, the the class and then they can earn the co-creator uh, badge uh, throughout the uh, a like a capstone or a project-based class because they're also working with others on it and that co-creator course basically uh, I, I characterize as an additional sort of digital um, uh, teaching assistant uh, in the course uh, is the way to think about how we use those. So we also did a variety of other things like uh, curriculum workshops, uh, uh, doing keynote uh, addresses at uh, universities, working uh, with them with uh, uh, workshopping these methods, designer panels, talking about what the experience of being a professional designer is like uh, and the like, and also really basically customized what it is that we were doing with each of the schools um, and basically working with, for example, the presidents and, and, and uh, um, provosts of, of schools, uh, of design schools themselves, as well as, you know, the deans and, and, and faculty at um, uh, the schools within universities uh, as well. And they determined what it is that we wanted to work on together. But all of this also uh, provided a view of the effective patterns uh, for over uh, for all schools as well, which I'm going to get into in a minute. So what did we do? We did things like a hosted um, senior um, uh, executive uh, uh, talent uh, from like president and, and provost and like uh, from the art center uh, college of design, as well as Northwestern uh, university. We had the matter Austin studio, um, Brown University and RISD. We've done a number of things, you know, with uh, both with the faculty and with students, and also helping them develop a new um, new master's program uh, for design and engineering. Um, working with the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to be doing a, another course, <laughs> teaching a course there in a couple of hours from now. Um, doing a keynote, doing panel cl a, a class, and, and also um, being a judge in a in a uh, design competition. Um, Working with the, Dan, uh, the Stanford D School, uh, in a particular there, uh, providing a new perspective uh, that isn't there currently or wasn't there currently. Their focus is, is very much on entrepreneurial um, education uh, for design and design thinking. And um, I wanted to introduce, which I do now on a regular basis, sort of a, an enterprise focus you know, as well, uh, so that a number of students that um, may well be thinking about, you know, uh, entrepreneurial design, you also want to get into entrepreneurial design, be able to actually create, create new ideas, new products and the like inside uh, larger companies as well. Um, we did some teaching and work workshopping at the Oxford Foundry. Um, also with these historically black colleges and universities that the United States has uh, are really, really important for 
um, really the diversity of our teams and really ensuring that we have uh, a representative uh, um, uh, sort of balance of, of the various uh, um, racial uh, sort of compositions of our groups and the like. And so we've been doing a lot of work for the last two years uh, with those schools, with doing uh, keynotes, uh, career talks, workshops, and competitions as well. We also did a thing with a lot of uh, students, uh, as well as faculty and even deans of design schools, as well as uh, about 100 uh, IBM uh, designers as well on something that at the beginning of um, the whole pandemic, uh, where we got together with the World Design Organization and Design for America and ran a COVID-19 design challenge, which was really an interesting thing from the point of view of designers that have been focused largely on craft, having their first experience with actually trying to solve real world problems using these methods as well and realizing how powerful they can be, but also how to more effectively be able to do that, which is often not the way that we teach this work as well. Here, another example, working with the University of uh, San Diego um, engineering and design uh, and a design course that we did, um, focused on improving the lives of Parkinson's patients. And uh, the, the head of that uh, uh, organization is actually Don Norman, who you can see in the, in the center of uh, this picture, who uh, is quite well known, uh, obviously, in the design circles, being sort of the guru and father of a lot of the work that we're doing uh, uh, for, for a lot of decades. I, I based the, uh, the first, um, prior to design thinking, we worked on uh, user-centered uh, design at IBM. And uh, I introduced that in the middle 90s to IBM based on uh, Don Norman's uh, work. So what, what happened, though, was that we ended up talking more about while we're doing this work at um, uh, UC San Diego uh, with Don and his team. Uh, Don and I really started to go talking about where design education was really at and where it could go. Uh, and so we had some conversations over dinners and the like over the course of about a year uh, on that. And that led to an initiative that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But before I do that, I also wanted to just give you sort of my perspectives on design uh, that is informing some of the work that we're doing uh, together and also some of the work that we're doing uh, at IBM as well, which is really that, when I look at the, the three decades or so that I've been focused in this area, focused on design, I've really seen over the course of those three decades, a phenomenal change in really the power of design. And, you know, as a quickie story, uh, some, I think uh, about 15 years ago, I had this designer, a phenomenal designer actually, working with a whole development and business team, um, whiteboarding a design uh, of a of a product, and um, he just whiteboarded it all up. And then uh, a week later, they had another meeting, and he said, "Oh yeah, I changed my idea. Idea. I wanted. Here's another way that that, that we can design this product." And there was this almost revolt on the team uh, because they, had, they said, "Hey, look, they loved everything that he did, and that he impl they had implemented everything that he had actually whiteboarded uh, during that week." And so they were really disappointed that uh, that that he had a dr drastically different design uh, uh, as well. But he had never experienced that before because in the past designers wouldn't have as much power it was sort of like okay here's the design and then there's some elements of that that might get into the product but we're now in a position in the world where uh, designers have a lot of power uh, and they can have a lot of impact with their with their design and that impact though can either be positive and negative so in the past you know, the positive and negative impact was kind of minimal stuff on the left uh, part of that, of this chart. But, you know, toward the right of this chart, we're now in a situation where the kinds of things that designers can, um, uh, can impact uh, are, like I said, uh, so some great um, uh, positive things, amazing experiences for our users that are delightful, um, ones that are just great for, for their mental health, great for the environment, et cetera, um, as well as the, the opposite of that, really doing a lot of design that's gonna, 
going to create, you know, mental health problems, people that are now, you know, addicted to a product, uh, uh, for example, and that they're spending way too much time, you know, uh, doing that. Um, designs that are going to impact sort of the environment. Uh, also, uh, designs that are going to impact the way that, that societies work and democracies work uh, and the like as well. So I think, I mean, it's a great thing that we should celebrate that design is now so powerful, but it's also the case that we need to, with that power, realize that we need to take the responsibility to make sure that the design that we actually come up with is in the positive side of this as opposed to the negative. And a large part of that also has to be done, I think, in design schools and universities as well. And the other thing I would add is that, you know, the potential influence of design is just on the individual person, um, as we have, I think, for a long time uh, seen. But also it can have and can, you can use these methods to impact whole organizations and even all overall societies. Again, on the left side here, in a positive way as well as a negative way. But the point is that design is not only powerful, it's also influential in a very broad way and can be in, in very broad ways. And so even you know, when, when I talked about that COVID-19 design challenge that we ran, the reality of that was people got their first taste of starting to use these methods for more than typically the work that they were being paid to do, the ones that were uh, professional designers in you know, creating something uh, within, their, within their company or organization. And so there, we have to also embrace, I think, that there is a, um, there's an aspect of changing the world that I think design can make a significant contribution to, but we also have to not just do that as a side effect, but that we also need to be looking at in, in, in specific ways so that we're actually teaching people to be able to use these methods to address those kinds of challenges as well. So we started this Future of Design Education project that is now running that, and my perspective on it um, is that we're trying to open the aperture of design education really to address even the, the last two charts that I just showed you. And focusing on design for society itself, uh, whether you're designing something that is a, 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 an object or, or a product uh, and thinking of the uh, implications of that design for society, uh, or whether it's actually using these methods to explicitly address a challenge that society has, uh, both of those, I think, need to be addressed. Um, designing for diversity, really making sure that we have an appreciation as well um, on a very popular topic is the focus on sort of decolonization and how much of the influence of sort of European tradition in a design um, should be balanced with um, a, a different perspective. And so a lot of the work on um, in North America uh, is focused on sort of indigenous uh, and black uh, culture and what kinds of um, contributions that can make that are very different. And a lot of the work, for example, in the indigenous uh, area is, is also uh, very, very helpful and actually trying to uh, address designing products that are more sustainable. And so uh, there's just huge value in focusing in that area. The other one is to design for the future. A lot of the work that has been done thus far and a lot of the work on design thinking is simply to design for today. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has also taught us uh, that the strategic foresight methods that you know some of us have been teaching um, are becoming you know front and center and that we can't do for example design thinking without also doing strategic foresight because i mean it used to be the case that would people would do strategic foresight and think about what could things be like in 10 to 20 years from now uh, but now we need to use these methods to determine what might things be like, you know, weeks and months from now. <laughs> and so, and coming up with, you know, three different scenarios based on really understanding the trends and, and the directions that um, indicators can, can, uh, uh, can 
illustrate for us um, is critically important right now for anything that anybody's doing, anything that you're, you're doing in terms of even determining whether your company or your you know, university is going to be going back on campus or uh, back in, 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 into, the, into the office. A lot of that work needs these kinds of design methods and you, and you need strategic foresight. Um, it's one of the things that I also teach to, um, to boards of directors of companies, you know, and organizations and nonprofits and the like as well now, now that we need to use these methods to really think about who it is that we're serving with those organizations and use these methods of design to be able to actually effectively design the organizations and the decisions that need to be made there as well. Designing for mental health is really important in the sense that, you know, a lot of the, you know, work that we've done in the area of, of, of social media and also some of the devices that we carry around, we're all so addicted uh, to this that it's, it's, it's really problematic. Even um, the over zoomification of our current sort of work from home and study from home um, requires a real focus on design for mental health uh, as well. Um, the platforms that we're using right now, you know, are, um, you know, Zoom and WebEx and the like um, haven't really done much other than maybe putting in a, a background that you can put in your, in your uh, Zoom uh, call. But what kinds of things could be done uh, with those those technologies to increase sort of uh, mental health. And also when you think about all of the design work that's been focused on trying to make people addicted for the sake of, of, of the revenue that those products are gonna create, but we've got to think about what the downside of that is as well in terms of our, our real addiction to these uh, products as well. And then designing for the environment. Uh, we're realizing we're in this, you know, uh, incredibly sad state uh, in terms of what it is that we're doing uh, to the environment ha and have been. And I think designers need to have that responsibility as part of their thinking as well to uh, factor in uh, what kind of impact uh, the designs that they're going to come up with uh, will have on, on the environment. And then designing for new technologies, thinking about, for example, AI. Um, there's a huge opportunity right now to effectively incorporate um, appropriate knowledge of, of, uh, of the corpus of, of, of data that's going into uh, these AI uh, systems. We have a bunch of work uh, at IBM and some tooling uh, to even uh, assess uh, the bias of a data set, for example. Um, I'm reminded of the early uh, work that uh, Kodak did uh, on uh, Kodachrome uh, when they first came out with color uh, film and they needed to create um, the chemicals to be able to create a, a, a good rendition uh, of what that what 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 a group of people, for example, would look like, and uh, they optimized that uh, for white people. Uh, and so pictures that had uh, white people and black people in it um, uh, would end up showing, you know, the black uh, people without any uh, sort of features whatsoever because they just messed it up. Well, how did Kodak actually realized that that's what they were doing. It was actually a European furniture maker that complained to them that the 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 different colors of wood uh, weren't being uh, shown well in uh, pictures that were taken with this Kodachrome, right? Um, and then they realized that oh, not only that's a problem, but also the fact that they weren't being very uh, effective at actually uh, realizing the racial diversity of the people that needed to be shown in their in their pictures, and so they changed things afterwards. But that's stuff you can see, right? That's actually visual. I think a lot of the work that we're doing with AI now is not, it's invisible, right? So the kind of biases that can be built into these systems um, are, is, is huge as a danger. So again, designers need to think about when we're designing those systems, what kinds of things do we need to build in so that we're guarding against the bias and that we're also more effectively designing them for all people. And then the last thing is that it's sort of related to a lot of the things that I'm talking about here, but that if we do the kinds of things that I'm talking about here, we're not gonna be saying as often uh, anymore, oh, th those were the un unintended consequences of the design that we, that we uh, actually put out there. Um, I think we need to spend way more time thinking about what could be the results 
of our designs. And one of my favorite uh, sort of design thinking techniques is called the pre-mortem, you know, where you have all the team that's super excited about the, 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 the design that just came up with. Um, and this is a common positive attitude that Silicon Valley uh, uh, startups have had all, for all these years. If you give them the pre-mortem, which is basically saying to them, okay, now imagine it's a year into the future and what you've just designed was a complete failure. It was just an absolute failure. What went wrong? Um, and actually imagining that it failed and then working back from that and saying, well, actually the, this could have happened or that could have happened. And then to build the mitigations into the design for that. That's even just one small example, but we just have to do way more of that rather than being so positive about, oh, this is gonna be great for the world to put it out there in the world and then see what the impact is, that's how we end up with all of these unintended consequences. And I think we need to be able to anticipate those with doing things like strategic foresighting and a lot of the other things that I'm talking about here as well. Uh, so the work that we're doing uh, is, uh, is basically to come up with a, uh, a framework of design curricula for the 21st century. Um, and we have an executive um, uh, committee, that, which is basically uh, Don Norman, uh, um, Meredith Davis, uh, and I. And then we have this steering committee that I, uh, you see the picture uh, of all of the uh, contributors to it. Um, about half of them are educators, but half of them are, are uh, practitioners, um, are leadership, leaders of, of, of practitioner teams in, in companies and organizations. And then we have thus far uh, close to about 600 people that are volunteered to help with this. And you can still uh, uh, volunteer yourself as well, uh, either being a, a contributor to actually helping to write uh, and, and contribute directly to uh, the curricula that we're developing, uh, as well as uh, being a, a reviewer or even just staying up to date on what, what is going on. Um, but we have just completed four documents. Uh, one uh, is the, uh, the principles that should guide uh, design for the future, design education for the future. Uh, another one, the uh, topics that we think uh, should be inc uh, included in future uh, design education. Another one on student characteristics, that is characteristics that um, students uh, have today going into design or uh, 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 education, and also the characteristics that organizations um, would expect uh, on the other side of coming, the, the students actually graduating with those uh, characteristics. And then we also did a bunch of work on uh, sort of the pedagogical uh, uh, techniques uh, that should be considered in education as well. And so so right now we're reviewing all of that and getting people's input, you know, on that uh, work. And then we're creating um, uh, working groups basically that are going to work on developing these, uh, uh, the content into uh, curricula and, and, and courses uh, as well. And all the way getting lots and lots of feedback, you know, on that. Um, and I ask you to uh, join us in rethinking design education with this effort. I just wanted to, to reinforce uh, our language uh, about um, this work that I've been talking about. So we want to make sure that we're uh, that the future design education work will uh, focus on major societal issues facing the planet. Uh, I summarized a bunch of those. Um, we also want to make sure that we're accommodating all beliefs and perspectives, and also those who challenge those uh, perspectives as well. Uh, we've been openly uh, soliciting uh, people that have a different uh, point of view than the typical or traditional. And we also make want to make sure we have a greater awareness of the you know, deterioration of economies and the environment and also even culture um, with uh, that, that, that has resulted from sort of colonization of the world. So there's a focus there too on making sure that we take a new fresh perspective, as I mentioned earlier, with a variety of other influences and cultures on um, the future of design and design you know, education. So with all of that, I thank you for uh, listening to me uh, during this uh, talk. And uh, uh, I think we're ready for some Q&A if uh, there are any questions that have come up. Well, thank you so much for this amazing uh, presentation. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, we have we have some questions. Uh, I think that uh, some are referring to the challenges, so the immediate yeah. challenges that that, that that are happening right now, uh, and in, in getting sort of more practice based content uh, in 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 this education. So, how would you recommend? Uh, so the more more practice based content goes into the, into into higher education right now. No, really good question. So I think there is still a place for um, you know the the craft based or practice based sort of education. That that, that is a foundation. That, that's that's what we definitely need to be continuing to do. Um, but I think what we need to do is um, lift that up uh, to uh, also include. These other perspectives that we're we're talking about. So if you if you're a craft designer, just as I the example I said uh, several times, um, that has amazing ability to be able to actually keep keep people engaged on a, on a on a web page, for example, uh, on let's say social media platform, um, and the organization and the company you work for just wants you to uh, design this thing in a way that that it it just uh, makes people glued to you know the uh, uh, that page uh, and also you even work on other ways to be able to actually even bring up content that is even more similar to your views and you know that might make you stay on that page even more what i'm saying is that the craft skills that you're applying to that uh, situation, um, you need to balance with, you know, sort of the ethical and the other implications of that design as well, and to be able to anticipate what that is. So, so it's 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 like um, uh, other disciplines that you know have codes of conduct, for example, and we may well need uh, one of those uh, for for design, given the power that design has now. You know where you know, you do no harm, uh, you mm. know, to use, mm. you know, the Hippocratic Oath uh, out of medicine. Uh, I know architecture, you know, has, has one as well, whereas arch architects a lot of the time I read are not willing to work on the, uh, the architecture for um, some of the for-profit prisons in the United States, for example, because that's against their, their, their uh, oath of office, if you will. And so I think a similar kinds of thing we need to think about with regard to uh, design. So, is is a craft skill uh, not important anymore? It is important, but I think we need to balance it with these other perspectives as well. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the elements uh, that is not being talked very much about uh, is uh, the students right now, mm -hmm. and the students. I think the students are right now under under the most amount of pressure yep. because, especially midterm, they've had to to deal with a new, completely new reality. So, what are your recommendations? Uh, for easing some of the burden on the, on the students. No, great question as well. And, and our COVID-19 design challenge actually had seven uh, how might we statements. And one of those how, how might we statements was how might we be able to, during COVID and working from home and studying from home, uh, improve the uh, educational experience. And it was interesting that uh, I think one or two of the uh, design um, uh, deans that were part of it were actually making the observation of their own um, children at home, their, their university uh, age uh, children that were uh, working uh, now from home and realizing that uh, a couple of insights, you know, one was that they, uh, what they used to do uh, was they would be in classes and we'd be sitting bums and seats in a lecture theater, for example, let's the, not think about practical, uh, the practical courses right now, but, um, and they'd have to listen to lectures, right? And so what do they do now? They now have recorded lectures, which is even worse in terms of just sitting there and, and needing to watch this for, for uh, long periods of time. And what was interesting was the observation that um, the students were, were getting really distracted by a lot of other things that they have on their screens and stuff that was more interesting. Right? So you think, well, okay, do you either try to block out all of that or do you try to make the education itself more engaging and more interesting and, and, and the like? And so their whole, that whole set of work groups that we're working on that were saying, look, we need, we need to up the, 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 the quality and the engagement uh, of edu education, but we also need to design it for the students themselves and the environment that they're in right now. And I, I'm, I'm totally floored by this, but I, I've got uh, uh, two sons at home still that are doing you know, university education uh, from home. Uh, and I'm, I'm surprised that 
little or anything has changed in the way that the uh, classes are being done. And also the even the expectation of how much work is going to be uh, expected, you know, of the students as well. Um, I should tell you about that. That um, at IBM we took a um, working from home pledge. Our, our, our design team uh, uh, actually created this, and then the whole company, uh, everybody started to post. You might have seen this on LinkedIn of people taking the work from uh, home pledge, which uh, really tried to empathize with the ways in which people are actually working, you know, at home and how we should change and how we should be more understanding of the fact that there's all this other activity going, going on. There might be times when you don't want to be camera ready, for example, there, there's all kinds of things like that, that we should be, if we're, at, and, and I would think that at least design education, we think of that, that empathy for the end user is really a fundamental of, of, of the way our, our, that we approach design. I think we need to go do the same thing for when we're doing design education and actually thinking right now about the ways that the students are actually experience this, experiencing this as well and factor you know, that into the education. And we also have to, though, empathize with the faculty that are doing this because <laughs> they need to also pivot. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. you and I were just talking Absolutely. before we started about all the technology that we all, that you and I have both sort of brought in, but we also have to realize that this is an entirely different world that the uh, faculty need to go work through as well. So I, I, I'm not just dumping on or, or blaming faculty for not, you know, being uh, uh, more focused on sort of the end user uh, uh, experience, which is the, the student uh, in this case. I think we have to do the same thing with, uh, faculty uh, as well. Fantastic, fantastic. We have a question here. Uh, do you worry at all about design overreach? If everything is designed, nothing is. So that was yeah. A, that was sort of a comment from I love that. I love that. I, I think that there's a, um, and, and it's important to still factor that in. I, 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 the way I would characterize it is what I said earlier, that I think design sensibility is valuable to almost anything that anybody is doing. And you don't have to be a designer to do that. And that's actually how I would characterize the effective use of design thinking. Does it make sense for any organization? Let's take the, the people that I teach uh, in, uh, that are board directors of, of, uh, of organizations. Well, so is it makes sense for them to understand the organization and the the clients, let's say, of that organization well? Should they actually even understand the management of the organization that they are governing, you know, effectively? Yeah. <laughs> and and the, so these kinds of methods, I think, are just, I think, core to the way that we can improve the world, period. I don't think that's design over overreach. I think that's that's but but when start when people start to think, and I did actually have a I did a talk at a university and it was an interdisciplinary talk. And uh, I had one of the senior people out of the business school say, oh, but when, now that we're all using design thinking, do we still need designers, Carl? <laughs> I said, whoa, thanks for the question. Damn it, yeah. <laughs> We'd still need uh, designers, of course, to do the design. You know, design thinking is not doing design. It's just doing, it's just a collaborative, a, a set of collaborative methods to be able to get people to think about um, collectively what it is that they're uh, trying to accomplish and using a design sensibility, if you will, to do that, you know, collaboratively. But do you still need visual designers, user experience designers, user researchers, and content designers, and all the rest of it, uh, um, uh, industrial designers. Absolutely. Uh, that doesn't mean that that, that lessens at all the, the need we have for those. But I, I wouldn't say that it's design overreach if we're saying that, like I said, that a designer needs to think about the implications of their design and to be able to actually have the knowledge of, of uh, the broader perspective that their design is going to, to, to uh, be able to provide. I mean, we, we have a notion in the, uh, this uh, Future of Design Education uh, project uh, where we're looking at um, sort of tier one and tier two sort of uh, skills. Uh, and what we're basically saying is that, um, and again, this is evolving. So we're, we're, people are, can challenge this stuff and we're, we're going to be able to, you know, sort of react to the challenges because nobody has all the answers. But the thinking here is to say that for a tier one set of skills, I don't think that uh, it's appropriate to only be teaching the core craft skills, for example, as tier one. Uh, I think every designer needs to come out with a knowledge of some of these other things that I'm, uh, I'm talking about, just so that we 
we get the positive impact that I talked about earlier, not the negative impact of the power of design. And so I think that's not overreach. That's more us as a, as a discipline um, taking the appropriate responsibility for the power of our discipline is the way that I would put it. Fantastic, fantastic. Another question we have, should design education be compulsory like maths? Yeah, interesting question too. I, I, think, I think design thinking education done right uh, may well need to be. Um, and that's sort of the approach that I've taken with some of the, my teaching that I've done over the last five years. And people have come back to me that have been in a variety of other disciplines coming back saying, you know what, the best course that I ever took <laughs> that, that, that is helping me in my day-to-day -day life is in fact the innovation by design course that, 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 that they took. And so I think there is a value to, again, the the way I like to characterize it, uh, design thinking is that it's designed sensibilities. It's not learning, to, it's not design. Uh, and we have to hammer that uh, uh, idea home. But having, you know, a notion of you should probably empathize and understand other people. Mm, that might be something yeah. that everybody, yeah. you know, in this political climate. Well, <laughs> basically, we should encourage... Right we should encourage all kinds of thinking, not just design thinking. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And in a, really, in education. Think, yeah. And it's, it's critical thought. It's, but, but I think there are some things about the design sensibility, about the notion of really deeply understanding somebody else, you know, and, and authentically listening to them and understanding them like that is a skill everybody should have. Well, it's, it's also core to doing design well, um, but it's also one that, that that's relevant to, you know, everybody uh, in no matter what walks of life. Uh, another example, I teach, I teach a course to uh, medical students, uh, sort of me medical school students and early uh, um, uh, physicians early in their career. And they learn all the craft stuff, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, but they don't learn the bigger perspective. Like when they are, are they're gonna set up their office, you know, mm -hmm. let's now make it, you know, patient-centered. Yeah. What might be on the patient's mind, you know, them coming in, especially these days, even with COVID, how do, what, what kind of worries would people have? How, how should they design that? Even, even hospital clinics are virtually never designed with the patient in mind. Everything is, is optimized for, for the staff. Well, mm. here's a case too, where the design sensibility is relevant to, the, to those skills, right? Now, are they gonna be sketching some things out and you know, pushing pixels or, you know, no. <laughs> but it's the, it's the framework of thinking that I think is appropriate. Fantastic, fantastic. We have a question here. Uh, how do you find the scale works of these ideas in an organization, I guess your, the ideas you presented, how do you find the scale works uh, in an organization? Yeah, I think it's scaling something uh, is 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 difficult and, and needs to be intentionally designed. <laughs> so uh, when we started this overall uh, transformation of, of the IBM company, um, I mean, we, we use design methods to design the actual approach to scaling. Right, and which was we first chose the top projects that were actually chosen by the CEO to work on, um, and we purposely said we're only going to do projects that we have sufficient numbers of designers to be able to do. So it wasn't just a matter of saying, okay, let's just take some designers and okay, they're going to have to work on five different products. No, we're going to have projects that have forty designers on it because uh, that's the number that's required. And we're going to keep on adding designers and, and starting to do projects that that uh, or additional uh, products and services or uh, uh, engagements based on on sort of the the number of people that we have. We also I would like to also reinforce that we would also do um, basically pivot meetings. Uh, um, my boss never thought that uh, he never uses that uh, term, but he does that. He's a serial entrepreneur. He always has this level of thinking. So once a quarter, our leadership team, our design leadership team would get together in an offsite, you know, location, and we would have what I would call a pivot meeting. What is going well? What should we amp up? Yeah. What What's not going well? Do we need to correct or do we need to kill it? All right. And so, and there's no reason why a 109 year old company uh, that has some, you know, 400,000 employees can't be agile and can't change quickly. There's no mm -hmm. reason you can't. It's just you need the, the right mindset. So the right, right mindset with, uh, that Phil Gilbert, my boss, brought in was this notion of we can pivot. 
you know? And so we would pivot as an example, we, we hired a lot of visual designers uh, and UX designers early on. And then we realized, no, we really aren't doing sufficient work on really understanding the user research and like, so we hired a bunch of user researchers. And then we looked at, um, we now have had amazing things in the Adobe uh, 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 tools um, that look beautiful and work really well. And then when, when the product was actually built, it was like, oh my God, this is not what it was in the mock-ups. <laughs> uh, and we realized that what we were missing was skills in front-end development. Right. Yeah. So we realized that we needed to hire a whole lot of those people. So we in a quarter for a quarter or two, we, we, we changed our whole hiring strategy to hire um, front end developers. So so to scale, you have to intentionally do it. You have to constantly look at what's going well, what's not going well and be able to actually pivot, you know, as you go. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for 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 your time and for this fantastic uh, presentation. And we're looking forward to keeping in touch uh, with your project. Will do Thank for you. sure. Thank, Thank you for you. the invite and I wish you all the best with the rest of the sessions. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. Thank all you. Bye. Bye now.